Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dai, and in this video we're going to look at the light-dependent reactions in photosynthesis. How do we utilize light to produce food? While we commonly perceive light as a means for humans and other organisms to um, take in our surroundings, right, we tend to think of, of light as a means of vision, right, um, but it's important to recognize that light is actually a type of energy. Um, you may have heard the phrase like light is both a particle and a wave. We'll get into it. So similar to other forms of energy, light can propagate, it can transform, and be harnessed to perform tasks. Um, in the context of photosynthesis, light energy undergoes a conversion into chemical energy, which the autotroph then employs in the synthesis of carbohydrate molecules. All right, so what is light energy? Um, the sun releases an immense amount of solar energy in the form of what we call electromagnetic radiation. Um, among this energy, we can only perceive a very small portion that's called visible light. Um, other parts include um, you know, ultraviolet radiation, uh, microwaves, radio waves, all of that, the sun emits all of those things and, and much more. Uh, the transmission of solar energy can be described and measured as waves, uh, where the energy of a wave corresponds to its wavelength, and you can see in the pictures, it's like wavelength. Um, and the gap between successive points um, are crests and troughs. Okay. All right. So visible light is just one segment of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, um, and it encompasses many different wavelengths and their respective energy levels wavelength and energy level are um, related. So the longer, more stretched out wavelengths carry less energy, while shorter, tightly packed wavelengths have higher energy. And, and you can even see this in action if you go grab a buddy and a jump rope and try to you know, you can move it up and down and create you know, waves, standing waves. Um, it takes a lot more energy to make many tightly packed waves than it does to say make just one or two uh, long, slow waves. Um, so the sun emits energy, like I said before, in, in the form of this electromagnetic radiation. And that radiation, it exists in different wavelengths. And each wavelength has its own characteristic energy. Um, visible light is one of those. And we're going to look at how plants use that. So photosynthesis begins as pigments absorb light energy. In the case of plants, these pigment molecules specifically absorb visible light, specific wavelengths of visible light. Um, the visible light spectrum, which appears as white light to humans, to us, uh, and to other organisms too, varies. Um, it actually consists of a range of colors. Uh, so if you were to shine uh, visible light through a prism, the prism can break it into its component parts based on wavelength. Um, and a water droplet can do the same and it looks like a rainbow. <laughs> um, so that's our perception. The shorter wavelengths are violet and the blue end. Um, and then, so that's the higher energy. So think like UV energy, right? Like that's the, the kind that can really harm your skin. It's high energy and it can damage your cells. Uh, and then at the other end are the, the reds um, and uh, infrared is, is outside past that and it's a low energy um, low energy light all right so plants that commonly grow in the shade benefit from having a variety of light absorbing pigments because each pigment is going to absorb a different wavelength of light uh, which allows the plant to absorb any light that passes through so imagine that you're a fern down on the forest floor and you got to just wait for light to filter through all the trees uh, they have a wider range of pigments, uh, and that allows them to still produce plenty of energy. Uh, a common pigment found in all photosynthetic organisms is chlorophyll A. Um, this gives plants that characteristic green color. Chlorophyll A absorbs blue and red, but not green, making it appear green to humans. This is really important, and it kind of trips people up. Um, remember that it's going to absorb that means it keeps those colors so you don't see them. So it's gonna absorb uh, in the red and blue and it does not absorb green, it reflects the green back. And so what you see is the green because it's what it's reflecting away. 
Um, additional pigments like chlorophyll B, um, which also absorbs in the blue and then kind of into the red-orange space. Um, there's also uh, carotenoids, which contribute to the absorption of light in um, a whole range of different organisms. Uh, let's see. Each pigment can be distinguished by its unique absorption spectrum, uh, which indicates just the wavelength of light that it absorbed or reflected. Uh, many photosynthetic organisms utilize uh, a combination of pigments to allow them to capture this broader range, like we talked about with the plants at the, you know, the bottom of a forest. Um, so we see that especially in like rainforests where there may be very little light that gets down to the forest floor. Uh, we're going to see a, huge, a, a bigger range, more variety in the types of pigments and plants that live in those environments. All right, so let's start taking a look at how these reactions work. So light energy is absorbed by a chlorophyll molecule and it's passed along a pathway, that energy is passed along a pathway to the other chlorophyll molecules. The energy culminates in a molecule of chlorophyll found at the reaction center. Uh, and this energy excites one of its electrons uh, enough to leave the molecule and be transferred to a nearby primary electron receptor or acceptor, excuse me. Um, a molecule of water is going to split to release an electron, uh, which is also needed to replace the one that was donated. So oxygen and hydrogen ions are also being formed as this water is being split. Uh, the light dependent reaction serves the purpose of converting light energy into chemical energy by moving those electrons around. Um, and that chemical energy is going to power the Calvin cycle where we're going to synthesize sugar. Um, the reaction initiates within something called a photosystem, uh, which is a collection of pigment molecules and proteins located inside the thylakoid membrane. Uh, each photon of light absorbed by a pigment excites an electron in the chlorophyll, causing it to detach um, and then it's donated. So it leaves, the process is called electron donation. So you have this electron in the photosystem, it gets excited and it pops off and is donated to the um, carrier molecule. So to replenish that lost electron, water molecules are gonna be split. And that splitting is gonna generate uh, O2 and hydrogen ions um, within that thylakoid space. So each water molecule that splits will provide two electrons to replace those donated by the chlorophyll. So we have to keep feeding electrons back into the system so they can be donated out of the system. All right, with a fresh electron in place, the chlorophyll can respond to another incoming photon. The released oxygen molecules are then released out into the surroundings while the oxygen or while the hydrogen ions um, become essential for subsequent steps in the light dependent reaction. Uh, in eukaryotes and certain prokaryotes, uh, there are two photosystems. Photosystem two is the first one in line, and then photosystem one comes second. They're named for when they were discovered, not the order in which they participate in the reaction, which is kind of unfortunate. All right, so photosystem two is the first one, and uh, you're going to pass the liberated electron, the freed electron, through a chain of proteins. And you can see in the picture, it's gonna move through that chain of proteins within that thylakoid membrane. As the electron moves along the chain, it fuels the action of membrane pumps that actively transport hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid space. Hopefully this sounds familiar because this is really similar to how we do oxidative phosphorylation. Um, this process is going to create an electrochemical gradient, which we've seen before, very similar to what happens in the mitochondria when hydrogen ions are pumped across that inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, once the electron's energy is expended, it's accepted by a pigment molecule in the following photosystem called photosystem one. Okay. So in the light dependent reactions, sunlight's energy is captured and stored in the form of energy carriers, ATP, which we're familiar with, and something called NADPH, similar to NADH that we see in the mitochondria, a little bit different. These carriers store energy within specific bonds, uh, a phosphate group in the case of ATP, right? We have those high energy, kind of a little bit unstable 
uh, tertiary, third phosphates on those ATPs, and then uh, in the form of a hydrogen ion in NADPH. Um, they release that energy, so in the form for ATP, in the form of that high energy phosphate, and for NADPH as that hydrogen, um, they release that into the Calvin cycle, uh, and they lose atoms or a group of atoms to transform into their lower energy states. So for ATP, it loses that third phosphate and transforms to ADP. For NADPH, it loses that hydrogen and becomes NADP. Okay. Uh, the accumulation of hydrogen ions in the thylakoid space establishes that electrochemical gradient um, due to the differences in proton concentration and that charge across the membrane. And there's energy in that, right? So the potential energy is then converted into and stored as chemical energy um, in ATP through chemiosmosis, which we're familiar with, um, which is the movement of hydrogen ions across uh, their electrochemical gradient through the transmembrane enzyme ATP synthase. Very similar to what we see in the mitochondria, but with a little bit different end goal here. So hydrogen ions then pass through the thylakoid membrane via ATP synthase, right? Very similar to what we saw in the mitochondria. The same proteins responsible for generating ATP from ADP in the mitochondria. It's the same, same protein structure. Um, as the hydrogen ions flow, ATP synthase attaches that third phosphate group to the AT ADP, um, forming new ATP. So this time it's through photophosphorylation, okay? Um, this movement of uh, hydrogen ions through ATP synthase is termed chemiosmosis, like we saw before, um, since the ions traverse from a high concentration to a low concentration, right? Osmosis, hopefully remember, right, the, from a high concentration to low concentration. So chemiosmosis is just the referring to the fact that it's hydrogens doing it. Um, and it's through a semi-permeable structure, in this case, the ATP synthase. All right. Uh, the final task of the light-dependent reaction is to produce the second energy carrier molecule. So we looked at how we make the ATP. Now we need to look at how we make NADPH. So when the electron originating from the electron transport chain reaches photosystem one, okay, so we've, we've pulled all the energy out of it we, that we could. We used it to, um, right, to create that gradient, and now it's going to move into photosystem one, and it's going to get re-energized by another photon. Okay, so we, we pulled all the energy out. It's landed in another pigment molecule, that uh, photosystem one, and we're going to get another photon. And that photon is going to be absorbed by that chlorophyll pigment, and it's going to re-excite that electron um, that can then be used to create NADPH from an NADP um, and a hydrogen ion coming together. So solar energy has now stored that energy um, in these special carriers. And now it's available to be used in the Calvin cycle. All right, thanks for sticking with me through that. Um, I do encourage you to go look at the pictures from the book and kind of take your time tracing the path of those electrons and where the different excitement stages happen, right? Photosystem two is the first excitement, photosystem one is the second, and which photosystem is responsible for energizing which carrier molecules. All right, I will see you in our next video where we're going to talk about the Calvin cycle.